Hello again, physics friends. We are now going to stitch lots of different things together. We've talked about cross products. We've talked about the definition of angular momentum. We've talked about um, how the choice of origin affects the value of the angular momentum. And today we're going to put these all together and do an example calculation um, with something called the conical pendulum, which is a mass at the end of a string. But instead of restricting the motion of that mass, to oscillate back and forth in a single plane, we're going to allow the mass to move um, in uh, three dimensions, subject to the constraint of the fact that the string, string length is constant. Um, specifically, we're going to consider a restricted set of motion in particular. Like if we think about the conical pendulum, I can sketch it out. We have a string and we have a mass at the end of the string and we can give this string a length. Um, and in principle, this mass could move anywhere into out of the page or in the plane of the page. Um, but we are going to consider, for now, motion in which um, the, the mass moves in a horizontal circle like this. Okay. We'll define this angle alpha and if the mass is moving in a horizontal circle, that means that this angle alpha is not changing. So when we think of the conical pendulum, we, we can envision the surface swept out by the string of the pendulum, and that surface would be a cone, and the half opening angle of the cone would be alpha. So we have alpha equals constant. And now that we've defined the length of the string d and this angle alpha, we can specify what the circle's radius is. So r is the radius of the circle, um, and that's the circle, the horizontal circle that this mass is moving on, and we can see that that radius is equal to d times the sine of alpha. So we're not going to use um, the, the term r in our calculations, um, we're going to do just express everything in terms of d and alpha. So instead of r, we're going to replace that with d sine of alpha. Okay, so the givens in this problem are alpha, d, and m, and all of our answers will be expressed in terms of those quantities. And we're going to solve this, we're going to basically calculate the angular momentum of this mass in two cases. Case one is we're going to put our origin at the center of the circle. And case two is we'll put the origin at the point of attachment. And we're going to learn um, that in one case, the angular momentum is constant. If we put our origin here, we're going to find the angular momentum is constant. In the other case, we'll find that the magnitude of the angular momentum is constant, but its direction changes, so there must be a torque. So similar to the example we've talked about before, the choice of origin when calculating the angular momentum will affect, number one, the magnitude of the angular momentum, and number two, the direction of the angular momentum vector, and number three will impact whether or not the angular momentum is constant. So that's where we're headed today. Um, so let's dive in with the first case. So we have, for case one, the origin at the center of the circle. So here we have the point of attachment. We have the mass at the end of the string moving in a horizontal circle. We have an angle between the vertical and the string of alpha. We have a string length of d, and we have some angular velocity, omega, the rate of change of angle with time. And that's a constant, we're assuming. <clears throat> the particle has a linear momentum that's tangential to the circle, like so, and a position vector from the origin out to the point, like so. And the position vector and the momentum vector are perpendicular. We know that um, from the properties of circular motion. So let's call the angular momentum in this case L1 because we're talking about case one. It's defined to be this position vector, which I'll call R1, and um, crossed into P. We only need one P because the momentum in both cases <clears throat> will be the same. What is the magnitude of this R1 vector? Well, it's simply the radius 
of the circle, which is d times the sine of alpha. We also know that the velocity can be written, um, or the speed rather, can be written as the size of the circle times this angular velocity omega. So we can then write the magnitude of the angular momentum. Magnitude of L1 is equal to mag R1 mag P times the sine of the angle in between R and P, which in this case is 90 degrees. Mag R1 is d sine of alpha. The momentum is the mass m, which we indicated in the first picture. I'll copy that down here, times the speed, um, which is mag r1 times omega. <coughs> Excuse me. And the sine of um, 90 degrees is 1. The magnitude of r is uh, d sine alpha, so we're going to get another d and another sine alpha. So at the end of the day, <coughs> we can say the angular momentum in this first case is m d squared omega times the square of the sine of alpha, where alpha is that constant angle um, between the vertical and the string. Okay. How about the, so we have the magnitude of the angular momentum. How about the direction? Well, that comes from, um, it comes from r cross p, r1 cross p gives the direction. Uh, the direction of r1, um, so if you, if you cross r1 into p, you find that your thumb will point in the vertical direction, <clears throat> so in other words, parallel to the z direction. Okay. And no matter where you are on the circle, the direction is upward because r1 and p will always be perpendicular and in the plane of the circle. So we can draw in green a vector that represents the angular momentum in this system, given that the origin is at the center of the circle. And we see um, that this angular momentum is a constant in both magnitude and direction. What, what does that mean? That means dl dt is zero, therefore there's no torque. Remember, the torque was defined as R cross force, and that is zero. So next, let's look at the second case. We'll call it case two. And case two um, will take the origin to be at the point of attachment with the ceiling. Okay, so our diagram would then look like this. We have a point of attachment at the ceiling. We come down from there. That's our string. At the end of the string, we have our mass. And we have this circle of motion. That's the horizontal circle. We have, once again, our linear momentum, also in the horizontal plane, perpendicular. Um, it's still perpendicular to this radius vector. like so. And we have, um, well, I guess I should label explicitly my origin. I've used purple before, so I'll call that my origin. And I'll use blue to indicate my position vector. It points from the origin out to the mass of interest. I'll call that R2. And we still have other quantities like alpha is still <clears throat> this angle. The system still is rotating at angular velocity omega. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we can ask the question, what is the angular momentum in this case? I'll call it L2 because this is case 2. It's, once again, the position vector to the object, this time R2, crossed into the momentum vector. And notice the momentum vector is the same as it was in case 1. Okay, So we have for the magnitude of L2, we get mag r2 times magnitude of the momentum times the sine of the angle in between r and p. But once again, that angle is 90 degrees. We have the um, r and p are at right angles. Okay. 
And so we can expand out um, R2, in this case, is just the length of the string, that's D. We saw before that the momentum is equal to M times um, V, which is D sine alpha omega, same as it was last time, times the sine of 90 degrees, which is 1. So here we have M d squared omega times sine of alpha to the first power. Okay, So first of all, the magnitude of L2 is different than the magnitude of L1. So depending what coordinate system you use, you get a different value for the angular momentum magnitude, number one. And in particular, we can say more than just not equal. Um, since sine of alpha is a number less than 1, we know that L2 is bigger than L1 in magnitude. Okay. How about the direction? Okay. What, what is the direction of L2? So we're going to use the right-hand rule. We have R cross P. So the resulting angular momentum vector must be perpendicular to both R2 and P. And so in fact, the angular momentum vector is going to point out like so perpendicular to both R and to P, and we'll call that the angular momentum vector, point 2. And we can see that the angular momentum vector cannot stay in that position because as the mass moves around the circle, this L2 vector must also move around the circle in the same way. So although the magnitude is constant, the direction is not. What does the L2 vector do over time? Well, the tip of the L2 vector will sweep out another horizontal circle up here. And so the shaft of the L2 vector will kind of trace out this green cone in much the same way that the string will sweep out a cone, like so. So what are the, what are the implications then of the fact that the angular momentum is changing. Well, if L is changing, that means, uh, well, another way to say L is changing is that dl dt is zero, is not zero, excuse me, therefore we must have a torque. We must have a net torque on the system. Where is that torque coming from? Okay, well, we can talk through that. We have, at our point of attachment, um, is our origin. If we think about a force diagram for our mass, we have gravity pulling down and we have a tension force pulling along the string. So we have two forces. We have the tension force parallel to string and we have the force of gravity in the minus z direction. If you recall, we, we called the z direction up on the page, okay? Because the torque is parallel to the string, it is also parallel to the position vector, R2, and therefore R cross tension force gives no torque. Right, the torque, remember, is defined as the position vector to the force crossed in to the force itself. So if R and F are parallel, the cross product is zero. So that means there's only one external force that provides a torque, and that is the force of gravity. And indeed, if there's only one torque, um, it can't be balanced by another torque, and so you're going to have a change in the angular momentum. Now, in both cases, case one and case two, Right? There are still two forces. Right, There's a tension force in case one and a gravity force. There's a tension force in case two and a gravity force. <clears throat> but because of our definition of the origin in case one, the torque from the tension is not zero and the torque from gravity is not zero and they balance to give no net torque. In case two, however, with our attachment point up here, that zeroes out the torque due to the tension and it leaves as non-zero 
the torque due to gravity. So you have an unbalanced torque, and that changes the angular momentum. As an exercise that I'll leave to you, consider this instant right now where we decided the angular momentum pointed perpendicular to the blue vector r2 and to the purple vector p, and it points up in this direction. At that instant of time, what direction is the torque due to gravity, gravity, which is also the net torque, and is it consistent with the angular momentum evolving along this uh, circle? And does the angular momentum evolve this way, or does it evolve this way? Right? We know the particle when viewed from above, moves counterclockwise. When viewed from above, does the tip of L2 also move clockwise, or does it counterclockwise, or does it move clockwise? I'll leave that for you to work out. So we've had a chance to talk about uh, the specific case of a conical pendulum and learned how to calculate angular momentum and reason whether or not there's a torque and whether or not the angular momentum is conserved in these cases. Um, we're going to proceed in future videos to dive uh, deeper and talk more about torque and change of angular momentum, but we're going to pause here for now, and until next time, take care and be well.